in Europe, uh, where we have seen tensions rising, of course, to our east, um, at the EU's eastern borders in the Ukraine. We won't be discussing that uh, in our webinar today, um, but we will be speaking about what is happening also actually at the other end of Europe in Paris today, uh, where, we, uh, the, where the French presidency is hosting an Indo-Pacific ministerial forum, bringing together foreign ministers from uh, throughout Europe and Asia to discuss uh, developments um, in, in the Indo-Pacific, of course, and what that means for uh, the EU and for ASEAN and for uh, opportunities or needs, should we say, to cooperate. And here in, in our webinar this morning, we will be discussing uh, one specific uh, subset of that, that is the digital domain. Um, as we all know, the digital transition uh, has, has created many opportunities, but also uh, quite a few challenges for governments and other stakeholders uh, throughout the world. And it is in our minds uh, leading to uh, new opportunities for EU and ASEAN to cooperate. Um, so the aim of our webinar today is to assess uh, what is at stake for the EU and ASEAN uh, as they go through their digital transitions, uh, why the two blocks could be cooperating together and you know, whether we should take a block to block or a uh, member state to member state approach or perhaps both. Um, we can discuss uh, what ASEAN could gain from, from, from doing that and of course what the EU uh, has, uh, is, uh, has to gain from this. Um, for example, ASEAN countries are ahead, as we know, in, in fintech, financial technologies, and in govtech. So uh, what's there to learn for EU countries? Uh, how can the EU and ASEAN together also reap the benefits then of that, uh, the opportunities in the digital age for inclusive development, uh, for, to enhance their economic competitiveness? Um, and finally, last but not least, what can be done to avoid um, the misuse of digital innovations by authoritarian regimes and restrictions on individual freedom. Uh, because most of the countries, of course, in the EU and ASEAN are aiming for openness and transparency also in the digital domain as we see it offline. Um, so to kickstart our, uh, our discussion, uh, we, have, uh, we will have an opening uh, speech by Ambassador Igor Driespans, the EU ambassador to ASEAN. Um, and, after that, uh, we will turn to our three panelists whom I will introduce to you uh, in a minute. Um, finally, we will, of course, uh, then we will, of course, turn to a uh, hopefully very engaging discussion uh, with all of you present. And I do encourage you to, uh, to already start posing your questions in the chat if you join us um, in the Zoom uh, link um, to, so that we can actually uh, already start the discussion uh, as people go. Um, and then finally, after 75 minutes of hopefully engaging discussion, I will give the floor to Ambassador Soti Raku of uh, the Executive Director of the Cambodian Institute of International of Cooperation and Peace uh, for, for closing remarks. And of course, CICP has been uh, in the past year uh, a partner of the Klingendal Institute um, in, in working on this very topic of EU ASEAN digital connectivity. Um, so I'll look forward to having him uh, also um, in the, contribute to our webinar. So now first, as I said, let me introduce you to uh, the ambassador Igor Driesmans, who is the EU ambassador to ASEAN. Uh, since 2019, has, he has been based in uh, Indonesia and in Jakarta, uh, where the, uh, the European Union delegation is. Um, he's been, of course, an EU official for many, many years. Um, and uh, before moving to Jakarta, he was a member of the cabinet of Frederica Mogherini, uh, the High Representative, of course, for uh, Foreign Affairs and Security Policy of the EU. And his responsibilities already then had to, relate, had to do uh, with the EU um, and uh, with the Asia Pacific, including uh, ASEAN, uh, as well as um, other uh, issues such as cultural and transport and fisheries. We won't be questioning him uh, about that today, but I think in the past few years, we've been drawn into this uh, new realm um, of, of digital. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you very much. Uh, well, how actually is digital connectivity featuring in, in your daily work, perhaps, or perhaps not daily? Um, well, how much of it is actually um, on your plate? Um, you know, we have, of course, a digital economy with the, with the Singapore as a hub, the digital transition um, that ASEAN relation, uh, countries all go through, cyber resilience that has been uh, moving up the agenda, uh, e-governance and digital governance more broadly. I'm um, very curious to hear from you, Ambassador, 
uh, what uh, digital connectivity means to you. And perhaps you would care also to reflect on the report that we published just a few days ago on this very topic that was actually the, the, well, the, the trigger for our webinar today. Thank you so much for being with us um, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike, and good day to the esteemed panelists and experts from Europe and Southeast Asia, dear uh, participants, dear uh, audience, thank you for bringing us together and thanks for having me at this uh, high level online public event on EU ASEAN digital uh, connectivity, which indeed you organized together with the Cambodian Institute for uh, Cooperation and uh, uh, Peace. Maybe also good to remind the audience that this session is part of a series of, of joint activities between EU and ASEAN based uh, think tanks to promote long term exchanges amongst the uh, brightest minds uh, between our uh, two regions and our hope is very much that over time think tanks from both regions will further strengthen their cooperation and nurture a new and maybe a bit more a diverse uh, generation of researchers and practitioners active in EU uh, ASEAN uh, relations. Um, now, today's topic is very relevant for the future of EU ASEAN uh, relations as we embark this year on a new chapter of our relations, uh, celebrating 45 years of dialogue partnership, as you can uh, see behind me, uh, and as we are negotiating a new EU ASEAN plan of action 2023 uh, 20. Uh, seven, so a very opportune moment uh, indeed. Uh, I think it's fair to say that EU ASEAN relations enjoy considerable momentum as reflected in the elevation of our relations to a strategic uh, partnership on the 1st of December uh, 2020. And this upgrade from a dialogue to a strategic uh, partnership, I think, reflects the truly uh, strategic nature of our relations and serves as a also an important platform for further uh, engagement. Um, EU is a very comprehensive uh, partner of ASEAN and we engage with uh, the organization in at least in 20 different structured dialogue, dialogues focused on vastly different areas, such as environment and climate change, train, trade, science and research, uh, maritime uh, security, and indeed, uh, maybe more recently, uh, digital. And yes, digital is becoming an important uh, component of our relations as, as it is an increasingly important area of policy work within the EU and within ASEAN uh, respectively. Uh, so maybe a word on, on the EU first, um, because at EU level, our ambitions are now set in the communications communication called Digital Compass, uh, the European way for this digital decade, which was issued in March uh, last year, and which addressed issues such as skills, infrastructure, uh, business, and uh, public services. And in October, the commission proposed a path to, digital, to the digital uh, decade with more concrete steps to achieve this digital transformation of our society and economy by uh, 2030. And the strategy serves also as a guide for our international cooperation and partnership uh, building in the uh, ASEAN uh, region. Um, now, in the context of this uh, cooperation with ASEAN, we've been supporting the development of an ASEAN Digital uh, Economy Index under the so-called eReady uh, project, inspired by the EU Digital Economy and Society uh, Index. And I'm sure Paul uh, will tell us more about that. I should also mention that the Commission adopted recently the EU CHIPS Act to enhance the European production capacity and to strengthen research and innovation at the industrial level. Uh, so an important aspect of this European CHIPS uh, Act is to improve the conditions for the EU to cooperate with like-minded countries to strengthen security of supplies for semiconductors. Now, quite logically, we're stepping up our cooperation in, in digital uh, uh, with ASEAN, including cyber security. Uh, think about the EU ASEAN ministerial statement on cyber security cooperation, which we adopted in 2019. Uh, we do so as we are faced 
with an increasingly volatile uh, international uh, environment and the acceleration of the uh, digital uh, uh, revolution during uh, the uh, pandemic, which I think uh, we can all bear uh, witness to. Digital cooperation also features high in our new Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and indeed a very important day today as ministers gather in Paris for uh, uh, big discussions on the Indo-Pacific. Now in that strategy, the, uh, uh, there's a number of countries that are uh, identified as potential partners for developing first ever digital uh, partnerships. Those are Singapore, Japan, and uh, South Korea. And as you might have seen, uh, concrete talks in the region have already started with uh, Singapore on this. And we hope that these uh, partnerships will enhance technical policy and research cooperation on infrastructures, digital transformation of business and public services, but also skills uh, development and digital uh, trade. Um, with ASEAN, we've started an annual digital uh, dialogue at senior officials level, uh, which is underpinned by not less than 11 different technical and policy dialogues, which were held in 2021, including inter alia on e-commerce regulations, broadband development, data modeling, digital uh, public uh, services development, and so on. And um, last but not least, uh, you referred to uh, the report that you had uh, issued, uh, Micah, uh, just in the intro. And I'd just like to thank you for uh, sharing that uh, in advance. I think it's a very comprehensive and thought-provoking uh, piece of work, which combines good academic knowledge with a good grasp of the actual state of cooperation and, and, and dialogue. Uh, and in the policy uh, brief, you speak about the EU's longstanding experience with regulatory issues as well as cross-border cooperation, while the ASEAN region is home to a vibrant digital ecosystem and the largest uh, and one of the fastest growing internet uh, user bases in the world. Um, and as you say in the brief, enhanced synergies, co coordination, cooperation in the digital uh, domain are feasible. Uh, despite significant differences between uh, our two uh, regions. And you rightly highlight digital infrastructure promising areas to deepen uh, the uh, partnership. So I think uh, this looks like an, uh, uh, an excellent platform for the discussion uh, today. So thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, hearing the panelists and the debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Driesmans. That's a wonderful introduction, of course, knowing where the EU stands and what the EU has been doing uh, in the EU internally and with ASEAN is, is a very important starting point for discussions. Um, I, I know that you may have to leave early and I haven't seen questions coming in through the chat. So if you allow, uh, perhaps just one question. You also mentioned the Paris uh, Ministerial Forum that is uh, taking place today. Uh, and we know, of course, that there's uh, several uh, of the governments uh, and then also represented uh, from ASEAN here and there in Paris. Um, and I wonder, uh, we, we, I think the, there will be several uh, panels, uh, including on, on one on connectivity. Um, and it, do you have any hopes or expectations perhaps from that panel to try and make it a little bit more practical what we are discussing today, which is, you know, also tends to be a, a technical uh, issue, a digital connectivity as such, but it's of course, you know, it's in our daily lives, it's everywhere. And, and what exactly would you hope that um, some of those ministers that attend the forum in Paris bring home that you can start uh, or continue working with them on? Well, I, I think it's already telling that ministers gather in Paris to discuss these type of issues. So I think that's very telling in itself and, and uh, quite a large number of the ASEAN ministers are actually traveling uh, to Paris uh, for that. Uh, in terms of outcome, I think there is one particular statement that I might highlight because it has a bearing on uh, the digital uh, cooperation that's on data protection. So I think a number of Asian countries uh, will sign up to a statement uh, on data protection. You know, we've 
had uh, quite some discussions on EU regulation on the GDPR uh, and on how can that maybe inspire some uh, Asian countries, uh, how they can take bits and pieces of uh, that uh, uh, regulation and how um, we can cooperate on these type of uh, issues uh, going forward. So we'll, we'll hope that that has a, a snowball effect on, on other digital issues where we as, as EU and Indo-Pacific uh, can come together. And of course, I very selfishly hope also with uh, ASEAN. Thank you. Yes, um, the importance indeed of data and the, the way we deal with data uh, is important for the digital uh, economy, but also very much a normative issue. So uh, thank you for highlighting that. Um, then uh, allow me to turn to uh, to our wonderful panel um, that I would, uh, you know, three panelists uh, from Europe and Asia, I'd like to introduce to you uh, in one go, uh, just before they uh, speak. Uh, we will first hear from Dr. Henry Chan, who is joining us from Singapore, but he's actually uh, with the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace. So as I said, our partner in this exciting uh, and multi-annual uh, EU ASEAN project. Um, Henry is a visiting research fellow uh, there, um, but he's also an adjunct senior fellow at the Integrated Development Studies Institute in Manila. So a true uh, ASEAN voice, if you will, uh, with, uh, with many different uh, well, uh, uh, roots. Um, his research institutes are in China's economic development and technology and growth, as well as in uh, ASEAN studies uh, as a new global uh, or in the new global order. Um, and of course, together with uh, my colleague uh, Brigitte Decker uh, and uh, myself, uh, Han Henry also co-authored a report that was mentioned earlier. So we will hear from him a little bit more about what our conclusions and findings were from the various dialogues that we had in the past year uh, as part of this EU ASEAN project. And I'm sure that he will add further thoughts because Henry is always on top of the, the news uh, and things have been evolving even after we, uh, we finalized our, our, uh, our report. Um, then we will turn to Ms. Jessica Wau, which is the Deputy Director uh, of the ASEAN Programme at the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, SIIA in Singapore. Thank you for being with us, uh, Jessica. Um, Jessica leads uh, at SIIA the digital programme, um, charting uh, ASEAN's digital future. Um, and I think this is a, a very exciting project uh, where there's been many uh, discussions ongoing between ASEAN states that, of course, is important for us here in Europe uh, to learn from. Um, her team is currently working on two papers. Uh, it's digital government to counter the effects of COVID-19 and specifically the case of Singapore therein. And another one looking into the digital economy agreements, where, of course, we know that Singapore has been a hub in the region. Uh, so very excited to have you with us also, Jessica. Um, and then finally, uh, we will turn to Dr. Uh, Professor Paul Foley. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Tech4i2 and a former professor of evaluation and strategy development at the Leicester um, Business School. Um, Paul brings in uh, vast expertise, of course, about indexing of the digital economy and society. Um, and following uh, you know, the successful development that he contributed to uh, a 45 uh, country International Digital Economy and Society Index, the so-called IDESI, um, back in 2018 and 2020 uh, already. Uh, he was invited also to represent the EU in, in multilateral institutions, such as the OECD and the G20, uh, where there was also increasing talk about uh, such importance for such indexing and benchmarking of the digital economy. Um, so he's been working in, in the past few years um, also on the ASEAN Digital Index, um, and this is one of the key reasons, of course, why we invited Paul to hear about this EU flagship project uh, of the, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but even of Global Gateway more broadly, I think we could say that's the EU's infrastructure uh, investment plan, of course. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to what they will have to say, and we will first turn to Singapore to hear Henry Chan. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you very much, Mega. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Oh, okay, good. Uh, I'm going to report uh, the origin of these uh, research papers and try to give you a little bit uh, answer to the name of this uh, conference that is why, how, and what on EU ASEAN digital connectivity. Now, there's no doubt that this pandemic has highlighted the importance of digital technologies and digital transformation and climate change 
are probably the two most buzzword in the world today. Now for the EU and ASEAN, when we touch these topics, the first thing that come to our mind is that these are very diverse blocks. Even though they are two of the most important regional blocks, but they are very different. If you just look at the per capita income of EU, the average is around 35,000 US dollar in 2019, while that of ASEAN is less than 5,000. In terms of human development index, all EU countries are in the high, very high uh, human in development index area, average almost 0 0.9. Why that of ASEAN, the average is 0 0.7, but we have three members that are in the medium ranking. So they are very different. And if you look at the organizational setup of EU and ASEAN, they are even more diverse. In EU, you have a European Commission, you have a common budget uh, to a certain extent. But in ASEAN, we just have a secretariat running daily affairs. There's no budget transfer mechanism. There's no powers from the member state given to the secretariat. So how are you going to discuss cooperation between these two very diverse blocks is really where we spend quite a bit of time. Now, we are accessing the strategic value of increased cooperation in the field of digital connectivity, as well as the practical challenges and opportunities of these stronger ties in this increasingly volatile international environment. Now, ambassadors already rightly point out that we are seeing unprecedented change. And Indo-Pacific is shaping up to be more and more the center in the coming decades. So in this aspect, all powers recognize ASEAN have centrality in this part of the world. So if you talk about Indo-Pacific, it really makes sense for EU to embark on a uh, Indo-Pacific strategy as they pronounced in 2019 and putting ASEAN as one of the core center. Now in the study, we identify three domains that can form the basis of a future share EU and ASEAN approach digital connectivity. First is we identify digital infrastructures offer very good connectivity and cooperation aspect. When we talk about digital infrastructures, of course, everybody mean that is the physical, the broadband, the mobile network. But I think we all can also talk a little bit about how EU is helping up to build up the human capital and the software infrastructures. Mikey already pointed out on this EU help to this ATICS program, which is the ASEAN Digital Economy and Society Index, which EU helped to set up since 2019. They spent three years and it's hoped that in about the uh, later part of this year, this thing can be put into work. Now this index has 47 parameters and this is a first hand collection of parameters so the relevance will be much better than the earlier generation of index, which is actually a collection of secondary informations. So this is something that EU has contributed quite a bit to ASEAN. Second one is the data governance and the digital trade regulations. Now, when EU promulgated this 2018 general data protection regulations, it really set the standard of data protection around the world. Many countries follow the EU. And in last year, when China promulgated its data protection regulations, in many aspects, it's really following the EU need. So in data protection, data governance, EU is way, way ahead. And recently, we have seen how this the EU handled the Digital Market Act and the Digital Service Act. All this really break the new ground on what people think about how we are going to handle the, uh, the undesirable side effect, which comes with this digital age. Whether we like it or not, we have to face these issues square phase on, and at the same time, learn from the best practices in which EU is quite advanced in this aspect. Now, EU, in this two digital market act and this digital service act, they touch on very touchy issues like digital service taxes, legal responsibility of online intermediaries and platform, 
in social networks, app stores, and this platform gateway. All these are very, very difficult area that many countries are now looking at how EU is going to put it into the final print and implement. Now, the third area that we think that there is a good prospect of a cooperation is digital economy and fintech. Now, there is one thing in which EU can really watch the ASEAN experience, particularly in, the, particularly in two very interesting projects that is just starting and underway. First is the Cambodian Bagum system. This is a electronic payment system that is centralized. It started in October 2020, 2020 and the latest report we, we saw from the National Bank of Cambodia seems that the acceptance is uh, going better than expected. Now, one thing we want to really watch very closely is that Cambodia run a dual currency system. Actually, 80% of the banking asset is in US dollar, only 20% in the local currency real system. Now, it seems that the parking system has enhanced the appeal of the local currency. And if this can be successfully implemented, we hope it provide a model to the future de-dollarization of small countries. So this is one thing everybody's watching very closely. How this digital connectivity can help in strengthening a country's financial and monetary system. The second one is the multi-CBDC bridge projects, working together with Bank of International Settlement between the Central Bank of China, the Monetary Authority of Hong Kong, and the Central Bank of Thailand and the Central Bank of UAE. Now, <coughs> it seems that the Chinese ERM CNY will be the first major digital currency to be launched. They just use it actively in the Winter Olympic just concluded. Now, with uh, Thailand being actively involved, it is expected that this Thailand will be one of the first places, aside from Hong Kong, that this multinational CBDC crossing border will be used. Cambodia has one and a half million workers working overseas. Philippines has 10 million workers overseas. And Indonesia also has 2 million or more working overseas. So how this project will work is going to have a major impact in the future development of many countries, uh, domestic central bank digital currency, as well as how they will design a multiple CBDC projects using across countries. Because we all know that one of the best appeal of CBDC is to use in cross-country remittance. Right now, the well spent on average around 5 to 6% to handle this a small amount. We hope that by doing this multiple CBDC experience, it can be cut substantially. And EU can watch these two projects very closely. And I think that this is how the ASEAN feedback loop can enable EU to also have a better system working forward. Now, we also have a very special recommendation is that instead of just a EU ASEAN block to block connectivity, we encourage also member states of EU and ASEAN to work either on a block to member state or individual member state to individual member state basis to help ASEAN to speed up its digital connectivity place. Because ASEAN is quite diverse, Mikey already mentioned that Singapore is very active on digital rule setting, particularly in this digital e-commerce. And it spearheaded this uh, digital economy partnership agreement. And now with China also applying to join this partnership. And I think with China's joining, it is very soon that the US and EU might come on board. And this is two-way feedback loop is going to help everybody a lot on the future rule setting. And the Indonesian chairmanship of G20 this year, they already put digital connectivity and digital transformation as one of the three key projects they will try to push at G20. So we hope that this connectivity has a new relevance in the sense that 
the ASEAN can contribute, can contribute its use case development to the more advanced EU's uh, project on this digital compass 2030, and we share the development and the progress of each others and help each others. Now, the last thing I want to say is this, digital technology is evolving so fast. There are so many use cases that a few years ago, nobody ever imagined. We migrated from a short message service to Facebook and now to video service like TikTok. So there's a lot of new areas that both developed and developing countries can work together to create a better tomorrow. Because right now we already see that digital technology is not just working in the digital sphere. Even look at how it invade our social life during the pandemic and how they are now shaping well orders. How are they are shaping news to be disseminated and public opinions to be discussed. There is a lot of things we do not know. And now this makes a lot of challenge to the government because before economic, social, and governance are separate. And right now we need all these areas being merged together under the e-government service that Ambassador has mentioned. We need many new ways of looking at things. And we cannot forget, this is the first time that technology is playing such a critical role in our daily life and in the governance. And it is not just a value issue that we have to handle. It is how we are going to combine a value issue with technology issues. And all these challenges are the topics that the think tank has to work on. And of course, with the full support of the government. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Henry, for um, well detailing so much what is happening in ASEAN and establishing clear links between uh, what the EU and ASEAN uh, have been doing and could be doing towards the future. That's extremely valuable. Uh, perhaps one quick question uh, before we turn to uh, to Jessica, our next speaker. Um, you mentioned the digital finance and that, how that is contributing also to or furthering de-dollarization, as you as you called it. Um, I with you, uh, of course, um, as a China expert, bringing in China into the discussion here, I think many people will be asking the question, uh, so that de-dollarization, is that um, you know, an, make, creating a more of an ASEAN or a Cambodian, you know, an ASEAN member state um, local system, or is it a sort of a turn to China? Um, that will be something that definitely people uh, around the world are watching. Um, so I'd be very curious to hear your, uh, to hear your thoughts. Actually, this experience of Cambodia is just unique to Cambodia because you remember in 1990s, Cambodia has United Nations uh, peacekeeping uh, activities. And at that time, it's the time that the US dollar become very dominant in Cambodia. Now, no other ASEAN countries has that experience. But the good thing is this, because once you have a dollarized uh, PEC system or a dollar system, you lose the autonomy of your local currency and you cannot really mobilize savings because these savings are denominated in dollars they can leave you anytime. So it's always the dream of every central bankers to have a local monetary system. And, but lessons could be very valuable because it shows one of the side benefits of digital currency is you'll be able to stand independent. And there are many small countries that have this dollar pack system and at worst is that they just use dollars inside their countries. So I will not link this Cambodian experience with this uh, superpower rivalry between China and US. But I would put it this way. If you look at the multi-CBDC, and if they are able to cut cross-border remittance costs significantly, then that is really a risk of US dollar notes I'm not talking about trade settlement. I'm just talking about US dollar notes used uh, uh, as a settlement currencies in small denomination in countries. Because if you go to Southeast Asia, you'll find a lot of people, they keep some US dollar cash at home. If you look at the US Fed data, as much as 80% of US dollar notes are overseas. People just keep it under their mattress. So when they go out, they will first use the US dollar to change for Euro or else if they use the local Singapore dollar change or euro exchange rate is very high. So that is a very, very dynamic situation. And, but one thing uh, I think that people should not look at this CBDC 
as a geopolitical issues. It is, it may be, but the most challenging part is the cybersecurity side. Because I think every faithers, every people who want to fade, the first target they will choose is how to fade the currency. It will make them instant millionaires. So I will put that this thing in a very long term, very short term situations. Because when you have hundreds of millions of transactions every day, watching the cybersecurity is very, very important. But it's so. often yes. what the technology can do. The technology can one day change the world. Mm -hmm. That is all I want to say. I will not push too much geopolitics at this point in time. Okay, thanks so much for, for clarifying. Um, and uh, I trust it will come up again in, in our discussion somehow, but yeah, good, you got us started. So now let's turn to Jessica, um, because we would love to hear, of course, from her, what, what are the key characteristics of, of digitalization in, in ASEAN? Uh, we just heard from Henry, uh, you know, some first uh, uh, initial thoughts, and I think you can delve into this uh, more deeply, uh, perhaps also into Singapore's role in the digital connectivity uh, of the Indo-Pacific and uh, within the Indo-Pacific, but also with ASEAN. Um, and a, a very specific question also to you is uh, whether you expect the rapid digitalization of societies and economies in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, to lead to greater connectivity with the EU and its member states? Or, or could it also accentuate perhaps more the differences um, between the countries and, uh, and between the blocs? Very curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Micah. So yes, I'll get right into it and uh, talk about uh, what I see is the current state of play in ASEAN. Um, and also uh, what I think are some of the characteristics, like you mentioned, which are transformation, innovation, and regulation. I'll elaborate further. And then I'll talk about Singapore's role and some of the other emerging issues uh, that I see when it comes to the digital growth in the region, uh, which includes um, the skills aspect, uh, also mentioned in the Kling and Dale CICP report, and also sustainability, which is something that uh, I feel it's uh, intertwined with um, how digital growth uh, is occurring. So the current state of play um, in ASEAN um, has been mentioned that the digital is booming. We're seeing the trends of growth in e-commerce, fintech and e-services um, and the growth of digital trade facilitation as well, um, accelerated by the pandemic and um, the well-known report by Google, Tomasek and Bain has shown the potential of ASEAN's um, digital economy, as well as uh, how, how lots more, uh, 60 million in fact, new digital consumers uh, have been added uh, in the ASEAN region through this pandemic. But I think um, even though there's a lot of positive news surrounding ASEAN's potential, I would say that maybe digital is not booming as much uh, because there are some things hindering uh, this growth. Uh, this is tied to infrastructure, also mentioned in the report uh, and also by uh, my fellow panelists earlier, but the diversity in ASEAN and how digital infrastructure is lagging within the region. So less developed and rural areas in ASEAN still face issues uh, of low internet and mobile penetration and coverage. Uh, so that's one part. I won't dwell on it much because I think it's something that most of us know. It's just something I needed to uh, highlight before I go into the characteristics. Uh, the other uh, hindrance to the digital economy growth for ASEAN um, would be the issue of the digital divide. So with ASEAN's digital master plan um, announced last year, uh, they've also recognized how the pandemic, although it has accelerated digitalization, it's also shown that those without internet access in ASEAN have suffered disproportionately. So um, the population that is unserved or partially served uh, by broadband um, are not able to telecommute or uh, are unable to access e-commerce and healthcare information. And also that affected uh, schools uh, learning for children uh, when it came to learning from home. So, the main barriers uh, for ASEAN's digital growth would be um, this digital divide, um, the lack of available connectivity and the lack of relevant services and content. And of course, uh, digital skills that accompanies the digital growth. Uh, so ASEAN go governments uh, essentially need to provide support to businesses um, in order to uplift their digital capabilities. 
and also ensure that digital devices are affordable to promote digital inclusion. And uh, social measures will also be needed to improve digital inclusion, but the funding for these social measures will also have to come from somewhere. And that's where partnerships, I think, with the EU or with um, ASEAN's partners uh, are quite important. So diving deeper into the characteristics, um, it would be the di digital transformation, particularly for SMEs um, in ASEAN, um, innovation um, that's coming up, and also regulation or possibly the lack of regulation when it comes to digital growth. So yeah, uh, on, on the SMEs front and general digital transformation of industries, which is increasingly important, 80% of ASEAN's economy is powered by SMEs and the implications of uh, SMEs digital adoption are therefore immense. So um, while the challenges remain for SMEs, um, uh, through this pandemic, many of these small businesses um, have had to leapfrog to adopt digital tools to keep their businesses running uh, during extended periods of lockdown. And also a lot of these small businesses uh, found it increasingly challenging to cope with the changing customer demands during the pandemic. And I think when it comes to um, thinking about this digital transformation for small businesses, there's the perception that Digitalization is merely the uploading of written documents online, but the process of digitalization requires uh, companies to relook at their business models, um, which results in, in an overall business transformation and not just uh, changing some practices, but truly um, a rethink, a reset uh, in the mindset. And that's where governments and policies have to come in to support as well. So I'll give an example of Singapore. Um, through the pandemic, um, a survey by the Association of Small and Medium Enterprises and Microsoft showed that uh, SMEs, which uh, also contribute nearly half of Singapore's GDP and also employ two thirds of Singapore's workforce, um, SMEs actually uh, surveyed by uh, Microsoft and ASME uh, blamed the pandemic for actually slowing down their digital transformation plans. So we've said that the pandemic accelerates digitalization. Yes, that's true. Um, but um, you have to observe how it affects different uh, groups of people and businesses. And 56% of the SME surveyed also said that it was too expensive to digitalize. So this is why governments have to step in um, with policies because if this is the case in Singapore that is already advanced digitally, I can't imagine um, what it would mean for SMEs that make up a large part of ASEAN's economy. Um, the next uh, area is uh, the great potential for innovation uh, and also investment for Southeast Asia in digital growth. Uh, in the report, it also mentioned um, how the demographics of ASEAN are very favorable for this growth. And also uh, over the past few years, we've seen the number of new unicorns born annually in Southeast Asia just grow steadily. 2021, a year of the pandemic, uh, was also a record year for startups in Southeast Asia. Uh, at least 25 companies um, hitting the one, uh, US $1 billion mark. And uh, Grab, which is a super app, uh, known in this region for providing uh, food delivery services and transport services, um, had its IPO last year. We have Gojek and Tokopedia merged as GoTo, uh, an Indonesian um, app, super app as well, uh, planning to list this year. So we're seeing a lot of growth, uh, whether it comes to e-commerce, gaming, and fintech. Uh, but something to think about will be uh, whether... Uh, some of the other startups, uh, how much of this longevity can last once funding runs dry? Uh, because some of them are incurring high debts um, and it might also raise questions whether they will survive in the long run, especially when interest rates start to rise. Uh, the third area I mentioned was regulation. Uh, so we know that within ASEAN, each country has their own set of regulations and also, just because of the sheer diversity when it comes to digital infrastructure or digital adoption, um, it does make it difficult for companies to navigate um, the various restrictions and regulations related to the digital economy. 
uh, when operating or trading across borders. And uh, it's not just the lack of clear regulations. I think it's also how ASEAN has tried to come up with uh, guidelines and agreements, but these are not enforceable, unlike the EU. And also with the rapid um, pace of digital transformation, it's also difficult for governments to keep up. Um, I can share that in the, gov in the case of Singapore, uh, that's where uh, relationships, healthy partnerships with the private sector, um, especially the digital companies who are at the forefront of innovation has actually helped a lot. So this leads me to talk about Singapore's role in the region um, and the push towards digital economy agreements. So I would compare Singapore's role in digital connectivity to the time uh, when FTAs were being forged in the past uh, and ASEAN was able to form its own free trade area. So just as Singapore advocated free trade then, um, it's also advocating um, things to uh, an environment that enhances and improves the ease of doing business. And uh, for the digital economy, this would be the movement of data, uh, of course, in a secure fashion, but um, we recognize that the importance of cross-border data flows uh, helps to facilitate online business transactions, which are rapidly growing, as well as other digital economy services. So Singapore's role as a financial hub with its clear and uh, stable legal structures is a base uh, for many tech companies um, and their headquarters uh, are in Singapore. And also Singapore has the capacity and capabilities to move forward uh, on digital economy agree agreements, which it has done so with uh, Chile, New Zealand, um, and it's finished talks with UK and South Korea. Uh, and of course, that's where issues, key elements of cross-border data flows, uh, paperless trade, consumer protection, um, things that governments need to be seriously thinking about because the modern economy is essentially becoming the digital economy as everything rapidly transforms. So uh, Singapore has a capability and has taken the lead on this, but um, in moving towards the ASEAN digital, sorry, pardon me. So uh, yeah, Singapore has taken the lead on this, but and it's also trying to champion um, the region to think about a digital economy framework agreement uh, to improve the services that I mentioned to establish trade rules and to facilitate interoperability. Uh, for ASEAN, there is a data management framework and um, an ASEAN model and ASEAN model contractual clauses. Uh, these uh, provide guidelines for businesses. Um, and they uh, are supposed to ensure personal data protection as well. Uh, but as I mentioned, these are not enforceable and um, it's up to each uh, ASEAN uh, government, uh, as individual ASEAN government to decide how they want to utilize these frameworks and guidelines. And that's also why the, the EU-Singapore Digital Partnership uh, has so much potential and uh, is also important for the region, uh, especially for businesses that work across uh, EU and, and across the Indo-Pacific. So uh, that will help, help to strengthen digital connectivity uh, and uh, improve digital infrastructure as mentioned. Um, I think I can elaborate more a bit further, but um, I think the EU has provided a good model for the region when it comes to privacy standards. So with ASEAN, with a lot of the ASEAN countries trying to play catch up when it comes to the digital transformation, um, it might be easier for us when there's a model out there uh, to help uh, in terms of data and privacy uh, and security. Uh, I'll quickly touch on the emerging issues that uh, my institute has been focusing on. Um, so skills, um, uh, especially digital skills. So uh, finding the right talent will be a key challenge uh, for businesses here. Um, we've, we've noticed that bigger firms have a stronger pool um, in hiring talent from uh, top universities. And this goes back to the digital divide and digital inclusion point. Uh, so what happens when SMEs uh, are not able to uh, hire the, the talent that's needed uh, for their digital transformation? And this will have to cut across to education policies as well, and how they will have to adopt um, to be adaptable when it comes to uh, improving digital skills. Uh, 
And the other key emerging issue that we're also working on and focusing on is the nexus between digital and sustainability. So um, alongside a rapid digital transformation, uh, we're seeing how technology is playing an increasing role for our climate change mitigation and the green transition. Um, we need to be able to see how the ICT sector and how digital services, um, how their environmental impact can be decreased um, in the long run. Uh, but at the same time, this, this digitalization is a source of technological innovation um, that can provide sustainability solutions. So it's something that we need to be thinking about alongside um, the digital growth uh, for the region and, and globally as well. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. That was uh, really very interesting. And in this nexus between digital and sustainable is actually something that uh, CSP and Klingenel will be working on also next year. Uh, so we look forward to working with you uh, again and to, to learn from all and to build on your insights on this topic. Um, about Singapore, um, yeah, you know, of course, int very interesting. You mentioned again how uh, Singapore and the region has been looking at, uh, at the EU for, for data uh, regulation. Um, and I think at the same time, uh, as, you, as you may have noticed also from, from certain EU governments, uh, representatives coming to your institute, perhaps for, for, uh, with questions, the EU is now also looking at how to reorganize our government, uh, because uh, I think uh, one of the challenges that the many EU governments are dealing with now is that we have outsourced a lot of the, the tech thinking um, and doing uh, to consultants. So governments have very little uh, expertise in-house, and we find now that you know at times when when you know. For example, the COVID app had to be developed very rapidly. Um, we, if you don't have the technical expertise in-house, that can be a big challenge. And that's just one example of where I think we are now looking at countries like Singapore um, on how have you organized this? So that's another thing that uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I would love to explore further. I think there's uh, yeah, an important yeah. topic. Yeah, just briefly, um, it is something that we've been working on uh, the digital government to counter the effects of COVID-19. I mentioned that uh, healthy partnerships with the private sector um, is important, but uh, the Singapore government has recognized uh, its own need to internally build up its uh, capacity. And it, it, it has uh, uh, political office holders going for digital training sessions. Uh, and each ministry also has a digital person and they have to talk to one another. Uh, so that's part of what we've been uh, looking into as well. Yeah, so building the connections, as Henry said, you can no longer separate. And But how do you organize that bringing of together? I think, um, yes, Singapore, but also other governments in your part of the world are more advanced in that. So that's what we're looking at also. Thanks. Then uh, let's turn to, to Paul, because we, of course, have our third panelist. Uh, he's been very patiently waiting. Thank you, Paul. Um, as, as we said uh, several times already, you've been closely involved in the making of the ASEAN Digital Index. So we're very much looking forward to hear from you more about how this you know, project came about, what it's been aiming for, and, and how it will continue, hopefully, in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Mikey, and thank you to the previous speakers. This, I think, is the third or fourth time that Klingendale and Take for I2 have worked together. So it's good. And if, as everybody has said, there are huge benefits that you know arise from working together, whether it be EU and ASEAN or at a smaller scale. Um, so the idea of an ASEAN digital index arose in about 2018, um, when there were initial discussions between the EU and ASEAN around the development of a digital strategy for ASEAN. Uh, I think there was a realization that there wasn't very much data uh, that was around on which to make policy. And I'll move on to how um, information can be used with for strategy operations and monitoring towards the end. Uh, I intend to talk for about eight, 10 minutes, something like that. So I'll talk no longer than that. And they came across this thing called the Digital Economy and Society Index developed by somebody I know very well at the EU called Balash, um, which has about 35 um, 
indicators in it, and they are collected by national statistics agencies. Each year, Balash and his colleagues from EU 27 countries sit down and say, what do we really need information about? What do we need to know about to make better policies, to monitor things better, or to have better operations? And little by little, over time, that information is collected from primary sources, from households, from businesses, and other sources to try and find out what is happening. That is good because the EU determines what is collected and how it is collected and the degree of rigour um, and statistical rigidity um, that that information is collected within. It's kind of the gold standard for these things. There are other indexes. The problem with these other indexes are generally that they're generated from secondary sources, often the same secondary sources, the World Economic Foundation, the United Nations, the World Bank and others, uh, and the ITU. The ITU has great strength at connectivity. Um, generally, the coverage of all these secondary indexes of skills, um, uptake in homes is generally good, but generally um, business coverage is poor because those organizations don't undertake their own business surveys, or if they do, the statistical sample sizes are very small. So one of the problems of secondary indexes is you've got to kind of make do with what you've got. And to an extent, somebody else is setting the agenda. Somebody else determines what is included in these indexes. Uh, I was recently involved in, um, in tail end of last year in developing the UNDP Global Knowledge Index. It covers 154 countries, which is fantastic. I was involved in discussions about which items should be included and which items shouldn't be included. And the discussion was interesting about why things should put in. It wasn't always focused on what might be useful or how much overlap there might be in different variables. And I think sometimes that is a failure. What, if people want information, they want information about their countries and what they can do. Um, I know that iDESI that we became involved with and we developed in 2018 and 2020 arose because the EU27 DESI information set was thorough. It was damn good. But somebody stood up in Parliament apparently and said, well, this is brilliant index for the EU27. But what's happening elsewhere in the world? How can we benchmark Europe against other countries? Um, so iDESI came about to try and replicate uh, the Digital Economy and Society Index collected from primary sources. iDESI collects information from secondary sources and tries to match DESI as best as is possible. It covers 45 countries and it provides a mirror of DESI and an indication of what might be happening against um, the key areas that DESI looks at in other countries. So you have primary data sources and secondary data sources. What ADEX is moving towards is collecting primary data from national statistics agencies um, that should provide more of what is wanted. Um, I've had four minutes. So I've got two minutes on reflecting on ADEX. I think ADEX is good. It has taken too long, I think, to get to where we've got to, but it has enabled workshops to be held with all ASEAN uh, member states on a number of occasions. So they have determined, um, the, the people attending those um, sessions have determined which indicators should be included in ADEX eventually. There was a week-long study visit to Brussels. There's been online dialogue and a series of meetings. Um, and I think it has a damn good data vision visualization tool, which sets it apart from other, I'll try and share, from other um, indexes that are done. ADII has got something. So the data visualization tool enables you to click on Cambodia and see that Cambodia, in terms of mobile broadband uptake, has 96 devices per 100. Um, if you click on something else, it, um, it gives you the number for each country. Um, let's look at Indonesia. And the trend line from 2015 to 2019 appears along the bottom, and the ASEAN index is the blue line there. Most of the other things that are put out, the UNDP, um, the USA ASEAN Digital Integration Index, are static. They're often just written on paper. I think data visualization tools are good for policy makers, and particularly um, for or those that are less aware of the geographies and the numbers and how things compare. So one also has the ranking box in the bottom right hand corner. Um, it works. It's good. 
it's a nice visualization tool. It was developed by Pratik, who I saw was on the call. So thank you again, Pratik. You've done a brilliant job. We've used that um, piece of software on a number of projects, and it's always been very well received. Um, reflecting on addicts, I've got kind of 30 seconds left. I think the thing that I have been most um, frustrated by is that the project keeps losing momentum. It is a dialogue tool. The people at the EU developing it, um, Elizabeth, um, Party, Perty before him, Igor, um, Henriette, have been excellent. Uh, it has been hampered constantly by delays in management. Um, one finishes uh, a project, we finished the last um, workshop in June, uh, the next phase of ADIX is still not started. If one wants to develop an index, I think you need to keep people on board and keep them on board on a constant basis. Uh, there have been too many horrible delays uh, that I think have lost momentum. Um, okay, benefits of information, I think, are across three levels. They are useful at the strategy level. So for ASEAN uh, ministers and everybody um, talking about what is happening to develop digital targets, um, one can develop those targets perhaps more realistically. I think at national level, they are excellent for looking at operational developments. How many people are connected in Cambodia? Um, Indonesia and Philippines. You need to know what is happening in a country before you can um, put together um, kind of operational strategies. And finally, if one puts together a strategy, one needs to know, well, how are we performing? And as you, for, as you saw from the ADIX tool, one of the benefits of uh, a tool like that is that you can look at performance over time and look at the impact that you are having. Okay, I've got one minute left. I was asked to comment on the Klingendell document. You have done a great job, Mikey, Henry and Brigitte, um, in putting that together. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, as Igor said, I think it draws together a number of very clear goals. There is one hobby horse that I've told you about before, Mikey. It's the, the connectivity dimension. I think often people will look at um, the the household connectivity and forget that there is a kind of backhaul element behind it. If one looks at um, IXPs, internet exchange points, these are the big routers on the backbone of the internet that guide um, traffic wherever it is going in the internet. As you can see in Europe, there are 336 of these things across 38 countries with a population of 629 million. There is round about one IXP guiding all this traffic um, for, for every 2 million people. Um, ASEAN, 10 countries have very similar population, 655. Obviously, I think internet use will be less. The amount of traffic is less, but there is roughly 20 people for every internet exchange point that is there. In my opinion, there is um, under um, provision of internet exchange points and if I just share one more screen, just to prove another point, um, there is also, I think, underrepresentation of cloud services. So in the diagram on the left, the number in each country is the number of milliseconds, <clears throat> excuse me, for to access 16 of the leading websites in Europe. So Google, um, Amazon and those things. Um, the little box that um, is in the top right hand corner of the European map is the number of cloud service data centers that are located throughout um, Europe. You will see that there is no speed that is below 60 milliseconds and 60 milliseconds is where jitter comes in on video connections. If you look at the um, diagram to the right, I would argue again that there is under provision of cloud data centers. And the data centers that are there are predominantly located around Singapore and Southern Malaysia. Uh, you'll see that group of colored dots in the diagram on the right hand side and very few cloud centers elsewhere. Those cloud centers are the places where if you type in Facebook or whatever um, you're using, that is where that information is hosted. That is where the information uh, or your request goes to. You are then provided with that information. And as you will see, the Philippines, um, Myanmar, Cambodia and some countries have very slow or relatively slow internet connections because of a lack of provision of cloud infrastructure um, throughout ASEAN countries. So 
my one thought and my one hobby horse is don't forget the backhaul element of all, of all of these things because it needs to be able to accommodate the growth that will undoubtedly come. Um, I also said when you asked me to talk about this, um, yeah, data sources are good, but I become slightly skeptical when politicians use them as a tool for saying we're the best. We're brilliant. Look, we're top of this list. I think there is a thing called factor endowment that Michael Porter spoke about many years ago. Singapore, with the greatest respect to pe people in Singapore, is probably the best placed nation in the world for the deployment of infrastructure. A small island, few topographical problems, um, lots of well-trained people and everything. It has a wonderful um, kind of circumstances for promoting digital. Philippines, Indonesia have many thousands of islands that need to be connected, and there are problems. There are always going to be somebody that is top of a um, benchmark or an index and somebody that is bottom. I think there is education required of some people that says, well, we're bottom, we must be useless. I think some countries are performing exceedingly well, and there are ways that you can investigate this, even if they're not at the top or the bottom of uh, one of these things. I'll end it there. I think that's nearly 10 minutes. I know that uh, we're up against time, so I will finish. Thanks, Mikey. Thank you so much, Paul, for uh, for being uh, very comprehensive and, and concise at the same time. This is indeed a, a sort of a fight against time uh, because, uh, well, we're all pretty much 10 minutes left for, for the questions that we have. Um, just to thank you for uh, for highlighting uh, the, the ASEAN Digital Index, which, by the way, I believe today that you will uh, release a, a press um, package um, with that uh, Indo-Pacific Forum. And I think uh, on EU digital connectivity, uh, the ASEAN Digital Index is, comes in first as a, as a highlight of what the EU has been doing uh, in this field in, in ASEAN. So perhaps, you know, if you say the, the project had been losing momentum, now is uh, a time, um, you know, moving upwards again, because clearly with Global Gateway, uh, the EU's uh, global investment strategy now also taking off. This uh, this has to be highlighted, um, and and sometimes it takes you know outsiders' competition, you know we uh, or or other initiatives, uh, similar initiatives to, for us to see you know the beauty of what we've been doing uh, for a longer time, and uh, I trust that this is the case uh, here as well. Um, and, and I think it's important you highlight also, you know, let's not use the indexes to show off, uh, but also to, to help find the gaps uh, and to raise the ones that have been challenged, uh, you know, because of geographical circumstances or otherwise, um, and, and make sure that we have also, um, you know, an equal, um, equal prosperity uh, or more equal prosperity, at least between countries. Um, so um, I see uh, questions in the in the chat. Uh, there's one that I would like to just uh, read to you and, uh, and 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 hear your inputs because I think you've all. This is about um, the multi-stakeholder approach, if you will, to digital connectivity, uh, the importance of business, and and you've all been working in businesses in different ways. So I think it is uh, goes to all of you. Um, the question is, how can the EU include businesses more in their digital cooperation with ASEAN? And are ASEAN countries open for working together with EU companies? in the digital domain? Um, or is the region more tempted to work together um, with, uh, with, well, the, uh, the US or Chinese companies? Um, who would like to go first in taking this question? Uh, I can go first. So um, just, I think for ASEAN, uh, uh, especially the countries that recognize um, its needs when it comes to digital infrastructure and capacity building. Um, the, the governments and the people are eager uh, to work with companies that are able to invest in building up these capacities. Um, I would say uh, for a country like Singapore, um, it's uh, open to engaging with um, companies that have aligned interests um, as long as, uh, so, so business in general, we, are, we, are, we welcome investment. Um, we try to provide the right environment. Um, but I guess one example I would give um, would be, for example, in the issue of data centers. So there's a mor there, was, there was a moratorium um, for the building of new data centers because we recognized the carbon emissions 
So depending on the companies that are more forward thinking and able to put forward a, a plan that um, or, or a building that is more sustainable, these uh, companies will be more attractive when it comes to uh, working with the various uh, businesses. Yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Jessica. Um, Paul, you mentioned business coverage is poor uh, in, in some of these indexes. Is, is that what you would like to perhaps elaborate on or any other point? You raised your hand. It was a couple of other things. Um, yeah, business coverage is poor because, um, you know, lots of countries collect information about citizens, household surveys, censuses. You can, you know, add something on. I know having visited a number of statistical agencies in ASEAN countries that they're starting, some are starting, only now starting to collect business data. But it, in my view, you know, I'm a business. I, you know, my friend Pratik used to work with us for four or five years in the UK, is now back in India. We choose to work with who we want to work with. Um, I don't think there are barriers. There are barriers to the transmission of some information. And I know those have been, certainly personal information, have been increasing over years, cross-border data flows. But cross-border initiation of trade and things like that can't be stopped. You can't stop people sending emails to other people um, and communicating with them. Um, I think the point that was raised about uh, data centers is interesting, and it's something that we've been talking, certainly Henrietta and I were talking about, um, was that there is also a cost to the transmission of data. Um, and if um, cloud data centers are located a long way away um, from where citizens are consuming data, data has a long way to go. Uh, there is electricity consumed in, trans in transferring that data. So we've developed a very nice model at the moment of optimal locations for cloud data centers. And from that, we can look at the reductions in kind of gigabyte my uh, kilometers, miles, I'm so English, gigabyte kilometers um, that data is transferred transferred and you can actually put values on that of the uh, amount of kilowatt hours of um, data of electricity that isn't consumed because that need is served from somewhere that is more closely located so you're right there is electricity cost involved with data center um, creation and running um, but there's also this cost that is constantly going on in the background and will increase over time as the volume of data goes up just transferring all this data through internet exchange points and over backhaul networks. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, over to Henry. Um, and, and do add your final sort of remarks for this session, at least, also, because we're uh, getting towards the end of the uh, our session already. Uh, my thinking is that uh, definitely the EU is a little bit behind because if we talk about the most use case, which is social uh, media, definitely the US has a way, way ahead. But Paul has already pointed out, if you look at the ASEAN as a whole, you'll find out that the distribution of uh, crowd centers and the exchanges can really be optimized. And if you talk about the hardware side, the uh, Nokia and Ericsson are still dominant players. Even American players has disappeared. So my thinking is that if you can really look into what ASEAN need in both these software and hardware, I'm sure you can still discover a lot of use cases in which EU can invest in the CN. Like if you talk about crowd centers, you don't have to put in Singapore because if that guy is in uh, Vietnam, you send the crowd in Singapore and then strip him all the information, then you have what uh, Paul has said, you're going to waste all the resources. So I feel that if the EU government as a whole approaches, you can really identify what the CN really need and fill those needs just from the business point of view. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Getting us back to the hardware and the software, uh, of course, of digital connectivity. Um, I want to give Paul and, and Jessica also a final opportunity to say perhaps uh, well, some share some concluding thoughts. Uh, we are moving close to the, towards the end of the, the webinar. Um, and I would like to give uh, soon also to give the floor to uh, Ambassador Sotirak of uh, CICP. Um, but not before, of course, offering you the opportunity to share some final remarks, perhaps responding to what, what others uh, have said or anything that you felt you know, was not mentioned here um, that should be taken up also in our discussion later, because as I said, we will continue. Um, so perhaps even on digital and sustainability, Jessica, um, uh, an opening for uh, the continuation of the debate is even welcome. Yeah, I would say that um, 
I've really enjoyed uh, hearing all the issues um, that have been pointed out when it comes to uh, what we need to focus on for the digital digitalization in ASEAN and how EU can come on board. And I think um, moving forward, that's what track two players such as ourselves are trying to do to help make the case for adopting frameworks and standards uh, that will allow for interoperability and harmonization um, and to show the benefits, I think, um, for the ASEAN countries and the businesses. Um, and yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Paul. Thanks, Mikey. Um, I think my reflection is I really enjoyed reading your report, and I'm not just saying that. I think it sets an agenda for being active and proactive in doing things. Um, I think ADIX is a useful um, passive method of finding out what is going on, but it won't in itself lead to action. It might um, provide indications of where action is required. And I think it's looking at perhaps both of those things in parallel or certainly being more active and more continuously active in certain key areas that is going to be the way forward. And I think your recommendations that you put forward in your report um, does a fantastic job in uh, making sure that there are some, there is a basis for discussion. And as we have always done, and as I know you are doing, it is for ASEAN countries to join those debates and decide what is required there. It can't be another, this is what is going to suit you, um, kind of interlopers coming in and telling everybody what to do. But I know you don't do that. So I wish you luck with your project in the future. Thank you so much. And as I said, we look forward to cooperating uh, with all of you um, also in, in, the coming, uh, in the coming months and, and years ahead. Um, so with that, I'm afraid I'm almost going to have to close, but of course not before giving the floor to uh, Ambassador Pusu Tirak, of uh, our Executive Director of the CICP, our partner, as has been said several times now, in Cambodia. Um, over to you for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mikey. Can you hear me? We can hear you well, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, let me get on with it. In the past hour, we have had the pleasure to hear a very insightful opening statement by His Excellency Igor Drisman, Ambassador of the European Union to ASEAN, laying out the EU commitment to work together with ASEAN in the advancing digital collaboration between the two blocs. I treat this as a really uh, very welcoming sign. We are also pleased to hear the, the view expressed by our invited three experts, namely Dr. Henry Chan, Ms. Jessica Wo and Dr. Paul Poli, who have given us their excellent takes on opportunities and challenges related to digital collaboration between EU and ASEAN. They also giving us their interesting perspective on what required to achieve the forward-looking digital partnership uh, in order for the uh, for EU and ASEAN to reap full benefit for an open, safe, and inclusive digital connectivity and deepen the engagement between the region for a thriving and inclusive digital economy. The Clean Dell and CICP are pleased to be able to host this high-level online public event under the theme of the EU ASEAN Digital Connectivity, Why, How, and What, with experts from ASEAN and EU to raise more awareness of the importance of digital matters and to increase mutual understanding between the state of plays in the digital domain in both ASEAN and the region. For the concluding remark, uh, of which I have the honor to uh, provide for, the, uh, for this event, I have a few takeaway of which I would like to share with you as follows. First, the EU and ASEAN are two of the most important regional bloc in the world today. They, differ significantly in terms of economic and human development status, but share the common idea and multilateralisms and embark of, on digital transformation as an important agent for development. In this context, they are natural partner in my view and could work together to create opportunity and address challenges so as to enhance their cooperation in the digital domain. Second, the EU Indo-Pacific strategy of September 2021 looked at increasing cooperation between ASEAN and the EU as beneficiary 
to both sides and a good way of kickstarting deeper cooperation. The EU already helped ASEAN in constructing the ASEAN Digital Index, which upon rolling out will help ASEAN in the internal uh, assessment in the digital transformation uh, progress. And this point has been very well stated by Ambassador Igu. Um, CICP and Glingendale, the third point, CICP and Glingendale embark on a study to assess the practical challenges and opportunity between the two blocs and their member state in their increasingly important realms of digital transformations. My fourth point is that the, st the study identified three domains that can form a basis of future shared EU ASEAN approach to digital connectivity. One, digital trans in infrastructure. Two, data governance and digital trade regulation. And three, digital economy and fintechs. My fifth and last point is that the study have also suggested a block-to-block -block approach running parallel with EU and its member state with specific ASEAN state. In this connection, I would like to thank the three author, namely Mikey, and Dr. Henry Chan and Brigitte uh, Decker for a fine 25 page report on a title, uh, Growing to Get Stronger Together toward an EU ASEAN Digital Partnership. It is really, uh, to me, it's a solid foundation from which we can build a stronger and more uh, fruitful collaboration in the in digital domain between ASEAN and EU. In conclusion, I wish to express CICP sincere appreciation to our partner, the Clingdale Institute, especially to Dr. Louise Wen head of the unit EU and Global Affairs, and Mikey Okano Hedgemans, senior research fellow from the Clingdale Institute for the excellent arrangement of this high level online public event, as well as for the outstanding collaboration extended to CICP during last year. We shall look forward to another productive year ahead. I look, I would also like to thank all participants of this public event for your valuable times and interest in our event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Pu. That was a wonderful summary of, uh, of things uh, that have been said of the report and uh, of course, uh, I second you very much in, uh, you know, uh, praising our uh, excellent cooperation in this project and uh, the fact that we look forward to continuing that uh, with a focus more on sustainable and, and green technologies um, with digital combined, of course, in, in the year ahead. Thank you so much. Um, to close off, uh, two things uh, I would like to share with the participants that still are, because I'm, I realize we're running over time. One is, if you enjoyed this, uh, please do join us also in a continuation of the debate on digital connectivity in the Asia Europe Sustainable Connectivity Conference that um, Klingendal is hosting for and with the EU on um, uh, 22, 23 and the 24th of March. So that's exactly a one month from now, we will be having another big conference about digital connectivity um, online and uh, you will probably receive a save the date soon. Um, finally, uh, I would like to encourage all of you who have been here to share your opinion about the webinar um, by responding to the survey that will appear in your browser immediately after uh, we disappear from your screen. Um, the, the link to this survey will be there and we would greatly appreciate it if you fill us in on, uh, if you let us know what you thought of this and, and how we can, uh, where we should focus on as we continue this uh, work in the future. Thank you so much for being with us and we look forward to meeting you again online and hopefully soon in person uh, at the later stage. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.